Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Staying Safe, Preventing TB Transmission in Healthcare Facilities. This is Kelly Masoke. I'm the Director of Education at the Curry Center. Today, we have almost six, 750 participants joining us from across the United States. You should be able to see a participant list on your screen, though there are also many groups logged on. Today's session is being recorded, and we plan to post the recording on our website within about one week. You have all been placed on mute in order to preserve the quality of the recording, and for this reason, we ask that you reserve all questions and comments for the Q&A period, which will take place after the presentation. This webinar was produced by the Curry International Tuberculosis Center, located in Oakland, California. The Curry Center is one of five regional tuberculosis training and medical consultation centers in the country. The Curry Center currently covers jurisdictions in the western region that include Washington State, Oregon, Idaho, California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Alaska, Hawaii, and the U.S. Pacific Island territories. This training was funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Cooperative Agreement and is a project of the University of California, San Francisco. Today's faculty member has signed a declaration of disclosure and noted the following disclosure. The center is approved, is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The center is also approved as a provider of continuing education by the California State Board of Registered Nurses. This webinar is approved for a total of 0.75 continuing education contact hours. To receive your continuing education contact hours, you must have registered for the webinar, participate in the entire training, and complete the online evaluation. The website for the evaluation was emailed to all registered course participants this morning. Okay, we'd now like to get a sense of who has logged in, so please take a moment to enter your response in this polling slide. Okay, great. Well, it looks like many individuals and a few small groups. All right, welcome. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Kevin Fennelly. After his internship and residency at the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Fennelly was the first fellow to be trained in a special program combining pulmonary and occupational medicine. In 1992, he was recruited to the National Jewish Medical and Research Center in Denver, where he started his research on the infectiousness of TB patients. Over his 22-year career, he has been committed to the prevention of TB in healthcare workers, and he has consulted for healthcare facilities in both the U.S. and in South Africa and Botswana. He has conducted TB research in both the U.S. and in Uganda, Brazil, and South Africa. He was recruited from National Jewish, to UMDNJ in New Jersey in 2001. There, he began his research in Uganda, where he helped establish a DOTS Plus program to manage MDR-TB in Kampala. In January of 2010, he began working at the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center, where he is currently an Associate Professor of Medicine and the Director of the NTM Disease Program. He and his colleagues have recently demonstrated that cough aerosol cultures of M. tuberculosis predict new infections better than any other marker. And they have shown that the thoracic lymph nodes are very active during early latent TB infection in humans. Here is the agenda for today's webinar. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Fennelly. Thanks, Kelly. I hope that everybody can hear. I'm seeing some notices that uh, folks are having trouble with their audio. <clears throat> so, Kelly, I'll trust you to tell me if, uh, if I need to do anything to help folks listen. Um, it's great to have so many people here, and I'd like to thank the Curry Center for the invitation. Um, I was kind of hoping that Kelly would have invited all of us to San Francisco, but um, this is obviously a much more efficient way to, to go about things. So um, what I will plan to do in the next um, several minutes, about half hour, is 
provide an overview of uh, preventing TB transmission in healthcare facilities, but we wanted to reserve a lot of time for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I think that'll be much more interesting and relevant to, uh, uh, to everybody. So um, the first thing I'd like to do is leave you with the most important intervention to prevent transmission in healthcare facilities. We will understand the hows and whys of applying the three levels of TB infection control measures as described in the CDC guidelines. Um, those guidelines, as some of you know, are fairly encyclopedic, so I won't be able to cover everything, obviously, but I'm, I'm going to summarize the high points. And then I'm going to provide a few resources that should be good references that you can consult in the future, and uh, so you have some idea of um, uh, where to look and then who to call when you need some help. So um, first of all, I have a, a few potential conflicts of interest. Unfortunately, I have no financial conflicts of interest. Nothing's been commercialized yet. But I have uh, come up with a few gizmos. One is a device to facilitate um, uh, AFB microscopy using small membrane filters. Uh, I've got a patent uh, submitted on a cough aerosol collection device. And I've come up with a, what I think is a, a mask that will be more comfortable for patients to wear so that um, th we can mask them and they won't, won't be uncomfortable. Um, I've been a co-investigator on a grant uh, with colleagues at UCSF and Lawrence Livermore uh, Instruments um, to detect airborne TB and then otherwise have been involved in a couple of pharma um, projects. Uh, one on an inhaled liposomal amicacin uh, that's for NTM, not for, for TB, and I'm on a DSMB. But as I said, that's just for your information. I don't think I have any uh, financial conflicts. So to start with, I wanted to review with you all the fact that um, airborne TB is an assumption that all of us accept now. Um, unfortunately, for many, many centuries, um, it was not accepted. Um, this harkens back to the Middle Ages when um, there were uh, thoughts about miasmas that were these um, poisonous or toxic uh, myths that blew in from the marshes and, and were thought to create disease. Um, it was, uh, this, uh, these comments were, I'm sorry, these thoughts and concepts were um, finally resolved by um, Richard Riley working with William Firth Wells. And it was only in the 1950s and early 60s that they confirmed that TB was indeed airborne. Uh, hopefully most of you can see this picture of Richard Riley as a young man holding... You are no longer muted. And if you were a, a guinea pig in this uh, facility, um, you lived up above the... Uh, TB ward, this experimental TB ward, and if you were unfortunate enough to have a skin test conversion, you were then sacrificed and the number of nodules um, in the lungs were then uh, counted and they provided a quantification of uh, airborne infection uh, from, from the TB patients. So um, this may seem somewhat um, trite to some of you, but um, we've known for some time now, thanks to Richard Riley and William Firth Wells and others, that TB is indeed transmitted through the air by aerosols, that is by particles in the air and not by sputum. So um, we came up with the concept that we should be measuring aerosols and not just uh, relying on sputum uh, as a marker of our infectiousness. Uh, this picture on the left shows a gentleman who's actually sneezing. You can tell he's sneezing because he has his eyes closed. Um, and this creates large respiratory droplets that are great for old-fashioned strobe photography. Unfortunately, it's not what's really inhaled. I mean, within this nebula in here, there's probably very fine particles that are of the size that get inhaled deep into the lung. This more modern photographic technique on the right, uh, it shows a nice illustration of this plume that comes from a, from a coughing uh, volunteer. This is not a TB patient, though, um, so we still have you know, much to learn in terms of uh, TB patients. Um, TB is spread by airborne droplets that are very fine. Uh, 
the assumption for many centuries had been that, for centuries, I'm sorry, for many decades, had been that uh, these were in the one to five micron range, uh, according to William Firth Wells. Um, but he had never actually measured them. Um, and he even thought it was taken as dogma within uh, medical textbooks. Um, what he really said was that based on general principles, the size is less than five microns. So what we did is came up with an idea to actually have patients cough into a chamber and then do direct air sampling. So the next picture uh, shows a cough aerosol sampling system um, that is basically a cylinder with um, air sampling equipment um, set up within it, and it's then connected to the outside um, so that uh, we can hook up vacuum uh, pumps to it. Uh, the picture on the right is of uh, Harriet. Um, she was our technician in Uganda and uh, has probably done the most uh, cough aerosol studies in the world now. Um, in this small room that we had um, at the TB hospital uh, at, Mo at Malago in, in Kampala, Uganda. And um, we, she wore an N95 respirator, or, you know, I did as well, anybody who was in the room. And then we um, had the louver windows open and two fans directing airflow out uh, to the outdoors uh, for, for most of these studies. The first thing that we were most interested in learning when we started studying these uh, aerosols that were generated by patients is uh, what was the size? Is it, do we really know what we're protecting ourselves against? And um, this was the first um, direct measurement of infectious aerosols from TB patients. Um, what you can see here is the Anderson stage number on the x-axis. That basically gives us the size distribution that's listed um, below that where it says lower limit of size range. So it's really on stages four, five, and six that the particles are small enough to be delivered to the um, uh, uh, alveolar units. Sorry, I was just trying to read something that said there's some sound interference from the speaker. Uh, I'm not doing anything on my desk. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I was hearing a lot of noise as well. Um, so I hope that that's been resolved for whoever was calling in. Um, but anyway, the, the bottom three stages are the most important. And it turns out that about 88% of the particles are in that size range. So they're ideally uh, suited to being um, deposited deep into the lung. Um, the one thing that we found that was um, quite interesting is that there's considerable variability of the infectious aerosol production in patients. Um, this was from our first work done in Uganda. Uh, we did an initial pilot study in the U.S. at National Jewish. And what this shows is that you're more likely to produce a high amount of aerosol if you have a high AFB smear. Um, what this uh, statistical uh, graph does not show well is that um, there are a lot of patients who are in the three and four plus range who did not produce any aerosol. Uh, they're all hidden down in these bars here if you can see it down by the uh, bottom of the graph. So the y-axis is the aerosol um, on a log axis. So the, the heavy hitter here at the top was producing over 700 uh, colony forming units and that was just in 10 minutes of coughing. So this protocol is that we have patients cough for five minutes, and then they rest for five minutes, and then cough for another five minutes. And they simply do that at their own uh, pace and as strongly as, as they feel comfortable. Um, it's not been possible to measure just one cough, which is a, a common uh, question that comes up. This was actually fairly, um, fairly difficult uh, to do, and we had to come up with a simple method uh, uh, to do this. Um, so um, let me move on. So these are the results of the recent study that Kelly mentioned that um, we've published. And actually, it's a correction from my colleague, um, Eddie Jones Lopez, who's at Boston University Medical Center. Um, the, the primary outcome measure we used um, was conversion of the tuberculin skin test among household contacts. So what we did was um, recruited patients with pulmonary TB who were sputum smear positive. That was the best way to <clears throat> find patients in Uganda. 
And then we went to their households and um, performed both tuberculin skin test and IGRAs. We drew the IGRA before the tuberculin skin test was placed uh, the first time, um, uh, given the concerns about possible sensitization, possible sensitization. And what you can see here, I'm sorry this is a complicated, uh, somewhat complicated graph, but the bottom line is if you just look at the top half, the um, gray bars are the, the tuberculin skin test conversion. And I'm not sure if it shows up, but the um, conversion right there was about seven. I'm sorry, the odds ratio is about seven. So if you're exposed to a active TB case, um, the risk of infection was over uh, about seven times that of somebody who had no or very low aerosol. Um, low aerosol being defined by less than 10 CFU and um, high by greater than 10. The data are log normally distributed, so the median is around 10, and um, uh, some patients, as I mentioned, uh, can produce hundreds of CFU. So um, some people are very infectious. Uh, most TB patients are not producing much aerosol. If you move over and look at the white bars, these are the IGRA conversions. This is a quantifuron test, and we used the uh, quantifuron gold in tube for this study. And the odds ratio here uh, was actually over 10, so meaning that if you were in a household with a uh, patient who produced over 10 CFU of, of uh, TB aerosol, uh, you are 10 times more likely to um, have a positive quantifuron. And then the black bars are the, when we combined uh, the, patient, the uh, household contact, sorry, who had both a TST conversion and an IGRA conversion. And that odds ratio was even higher at, at 20 uh, or so. But we were, we were very conservative and we just used the TST conversion. The bottom half here, um, again, it appears confusing, but the bottom line is it's intended just to show that there's a similar dose response in the amount of interferon gamma that was produced. So this uh, delta TB minus antigen nil just means that when we um, looked at the interferon that was produced and subtracted the background, the, the negative control, um, the there was uh, a greater amount of interferon gamma produced among those household contacts who were exposed to a uh, aerosol positive patient. So I hope that's uh, clear. If not, we can discuss it more later. Now, this next um, slide shows uh, basically what we see when we use sputum. And as you can see, there's really no dose response there as we saw for the cough aerosol. Um, a common question that comes up is, well, why is that if AFB smear was a predictor of aerosol? And um, in this study, most of the patients uh, were uh, recruited to have higher uh, AFB smear grades. So there was not a wide variability in AFB smear. Uh, so that may be part of the reason why we, we don't see that. But um, the bottom line with all this research is that the AFB smear appears to be a risk factor uh, for infectiousness, but it is not the end-all and be-all in terms of infectiousness. And cough aerosols in this study um, predicted um, the amount of infection in the household context better than any other measure, uh, including uh, smear, culture, cavitation, all the factors that we usually um, talk about. Um, this goes back to the initial work that I did when I was at National Jewish. This was really our first uh, study. And um, we had only 16 patients, but four of them were positive for cough aerosols. Um, this is on the x-axis is the week of treatment, and on the y-axis is the amount of aerosol production, again, on a log aerosol uh, basis, since these particles are log normally distributed. So this um, Heavy hitter here produced 633 uh, CFU in 10 minutes of coughing, uh, whereas these patients here only produced a, a few. But as you can see, with just a few weeks of treatment, um, all of the subjects had this exponential decrease um, in the uh, aerosol production. And these were all MDRTB patients, which in retrospect might have been a little bit crazy for me to do, but um, uh, that's where I was working. 
Um, so one of the things that I was fascinated with um, in this work very early on was why this patient, this is a just one patient um, shown here. This is the patient that produced the 633 CFU on her initial study and then became aerosol negative at three weeks. And I'm sorry this graph doesn't show that we actually studied her multiple weeks afterwards and she was uh, always negative. And if you follow this dotted line um, here, this is the sputum um, culture becoming negative at eight weeks. Again, an MDR-TB patient uh, on directly observed therapy in the hospital at National Jewish. Um, had cavitary disease and eventually had a, a right upper lobectomy for the uh, cavitary disease. She had another cavity, which probably explains why she had this positive sputum smear, which I understood was actually positive for months. Um, so clearly, um, most of us have seen patients who we, we know that the AFB smear, especially in cavitary patients, the AFB smear can remain positive for some time after people become culture negative, but it's very, very discordant with the, with the aerosol. Um, this goes along with some data that was generated by Richard Riley's group very early on um, and was published in 1962. Ed Nardell recently um, reviewed this in the Gray Journal, the International Journal of TB and Lung Disease, and, um, and um, reproduced this table in, the, in that paper. Um, and what they show is that there were very few treated patients who transmitted infection to the guinea pigs. So this was, again, the type of study where they, they had an experimental TB ward at the Baltimore VA hospital. Patients were admitted and then you know, either put on treatment or not treated, and they looked at infection in the guinea pigs. And so you can see the, the, there appears to be an effective treatment. Unfortunately, they weren't specifically studying that, and the data are a, a little bit um, messy, so we need to really sort this out. But uh, the bottom line is uh, you can see that there's a fairly dramatic effect, um, especially in the drug-susceptible uh, patients. So uh, one way we tried to look at this when I was back in New Jersey is we created a model where we aerosolized uh, Mycobacterium smegmatis um, as a surrogate that's rapidly growing so that we could actually get the research done in a timely manner um, and looked at survival based on the um, percent of, air, of uh, colony forming units that grew compared to the baseline. And what you can see on this um, top line here uh, are, is the microscopy data. So over the 60-minute uh, time period, the AFB that we were able to um, collect was, was very stable. Um, but in terms of culture, um, it fell off quite dramatically. And this was based on either a, a method where we collected it um, uh, onto solid or, or liquid auger and uh, both were, were fairly consistent. So just within an hour of airborne desiccation with air moving by this uh, filter before we, we took the filter and then dissolved it and, and cultured the bugs, um, within an hour most of those uh, bugs were killed. So this is not TB. Uh, TB may be a little bit hardier, but we know that we've known for some time that uh, most uh, organisms don't like being um, uh, desiccated, and uh, many don't survive aerosolization. About 1 to 10 percent will survive. Well, this is um, uh, a reproduction of a figure from a paper by Mary Hutton that was many years ago, 1990, but illustrates an important point, and that is that uh, TB can be spread not only by coughing patients, but by other means. This was an unusual case of nosocomial transmission of TB due to irrigation of a TB abscess. Um, the patient was uh, patient A in room one, way down at the uh, left end of the figure here. And as you can see, patients who were um, in this area on the far left of this uh, diagram, patients in those rooms near patient A were very likely to convert their skin test. Uh, about two-thirds of them converted their skin test. And then there's this nice gradient of exposure. As you get farther and farther away from that room, um, there's a lower and lower proportion of patients who became um, 
skin test positive. So um, this, you know, speaks to the fact that we need to be thoughtful and careful with our patients if we're doing any aerosol generating procedures. Another one that I don't have time to um, really deal with here, but that was very well documented, um, was uh, there have been multiple cases of postmortem examinations of patients with disseminated TB uh, that was usually not suspected. And during a postmortem exam, if they use a sternal saw to go through the sternum to expose the lungs and heart, that creates a, a, a very luxuriant aerosol that uh, contains a lot of um, blood in the air and uh, contained a TB. And in one of those, all the people, all five people were, um, who were present were uh, infected. Um, so early on, before we were able to get some of the, the data that I've shown you, um, I was trying to understand airborne infection better and, and use this Wells-Riley model. So I mentioned William Firth Wells as he's really the tutor of Richard Riley, who I um, had shown a picture of. Uh, it turns out that this Riley is uh, uh, Richard's brother, Ed, um, just as a piece of TB trivia. Um, but um, what this demonstrates is that what, we, what I think we should really be interested in, and that is what is the probability or risk of TB infection. Um, and that's on the y-axis. And the duration of exposure is in hours on the x-axis. And what you can see is um, this turquoise line here uh, replicates that situation I talked about in a pathology suite where there may have been a very high amount of aerosol generated. So as you can see, if you were in that room for just one hour, uh, you were very likely to be infected. Uh, about 80, 75, 80 percent of people would be infected. Whereas if you were on this um, line here that's meant to show one infectious quanta per hour, which is what Richard Riley estimated in one study in terms of tuberculin skin test conversions for most nurses back in the 50s, it would take um, about a thousand hours to get to that similar point. So the bottom line for all this is, uh, and if anybody is a mathematical nerd and, and would like to go through this, please contact me and I can um, show you the original reference and all. But it's all to say that we have to think about not only the duration of exposure, which is something that most people in public health are very familiar with, but also the intensity of the exposure. So the there can be a wide variety, at least um, in our work uh, to date, it appears that three log difference is, is pretty reasonable, um, that uh, 1,000 quanta per hour is highly unusual, but some patients in some situations um, may produce that. So we took that, and I worked with Ed Nardell early on. Again, this is, I'm showing my age here, but this is 1998. And um, what we did was we modeled three different exposures, again, using that Wells-Riley model. And what um, I was interested in here is what was the effect of personal respiratory protection if we were in an airborne infection isolation room with, with very good ventilation. So on the x-axis here is the room ventilation in air changes per hour. And on each of these y-axes is the risk of infection or the probability of infection. So um, the most common scenario most of us are in with TB patients in rooms is the bottom one, which is a fairly low exposure, and that's 1.25 quanta per hour. And as you can see, if you're in a well room at six air changes an hour, you're not getting that much benefit from um, uh, use of any kind of personal respiratory protection. Now, this is with the caveat of all the limitations of models, uh, one of which was there's a homogeneous distribution of aerosol. And I've already shown you that one picture that there's a plume of aerosol. So one of my concerns has always been that if we're right near a patient, say, putting in a central line or helping clean up the patient and they cough, there may be a plume that has infectious particles in it. So I think wearing personal respiratory protection in airborne isolation rooms is quite appropriate. Um, now, if you move up to a higher exposure scenario, this was taken from an old paper by uh, Tony Catanzaro in San Diego. And uh, what they um, 
uh, calculated was that in an intensive care unit where a uh, patient was undergoing bronchoscopy, that there may have been production of about 250 quanta per hour. Um, and in this situation, if you just wore a disposable N95 type of respirator, it really would not have decreased your risk of infection much. Uh, whereas if you use something like a PAP or hood um, that offered a much higher level of protection, uh, you are much more likely to decrease that risk of infection. So I hope, hope that's clear. Um, now, we, you know, do we need PAP or hoods in all situations? Well, <laughs> I think if we're in situations where we have an MDR or an XDR-TB patient and we're doing bronchoscopy, that it's actually quite reasonable to wear, and, and the patient's not on treatment, uh, it'd be quite reasonable to wear a PAP or hood. However, we probably don't need that in most situations. Um, this was a, uh, the top here is a um, few bullets on a, a paper that didn't get much uh, attention. It was in the, the gray journal um, back in 2000. And there had been an MDR-TB outbreak on an HIV ward in Milan. And they found that um, a high proportion of patients who were uh, in this ward when the outbreak first started uh, developed MDR-TB. Now, this is not just skin test conversion. This is actually developing active disease. Um, so that's, you know, that's quite high. And then when they just did some very simple things, uh, they, instead of having a few patients in a room, they put patients in single rooms. Before, there had been a habit of leaving doors open and patients would be mingling outside and walking around. They kept the doors closed. They restricted transport and walking of patients and um, really mitigated the outbreak with those very simple measures. Um, uh, Kelly had mentioned that I was involved in the DOTS Plus program uh, that we developed in Uganda. And there it was a simple tropical medicine hospital with uh, natural ventilation and <clears throat> no special uh, ventilation system. Um, we did use uh, N95 respirators for all the staff and ourselves. Um, but um, we were unable to identify any transmission to healthcare workers or patients um, using simple measures that are outlined by the WHO. Um, we haven't published that data, but it's um, uh, hopefully one of these days uh, we can do so. And uh, in the resources, I'll, I'll provide that uh, WHO um, uh, document. So um, one recent paper that uh, it was way overdue, I actually wrote the editorial on this, and I think I, uh, my, the title of the, my editorial was something like Overdue Evidence. Um, this was from um, Ashwin uh, Dharma Dakari uh, and Ed Nardell um, from uh, Harvard who were working in South Africa and replicating the um, Richard Riley's guinea pig model. And um, this is one of the first things that they've published and really was quite remarkable in that they demonstrated that just putting simple uh, surgical masks on patients uh, dramatically reduced transmission to the guinea pigs. Uh, it was surprising to me that they saw a 56% reduction in guinea pig infections. And this graph here, uh, it may be hard to see for some of you, but the red line is the control group and the blue line here is the, um, uh, the guinea pigs exposed to the patients who were wearing uh, surgical masks. And so that uh, reduction represents the, the 56%. Um, so uh, masking patients is something that we've all done for decades, um, and now we finally have some data to, to support it. So here's the kind of the basic summary slide of what I think is the, the most important parts of the CDC guidelines. Most of you know these as administrative uh, controls, engineering controls, and personal respiratory protection. And um, basically, I think the administrative controls generally help with source control around the TB patient. And by far, the most important infection control measure is rapid diagnosis and treatment. Um, it's, I have not been able to find any documented uh, outbreaks or conversions once patients are on uh, appropriate treatment. If anybody has data um, uh, documenting that, please let me know. I've, I've spent several years trying to find that. Um, so I think if we know that patients are on appropriate treatment, 
And these days with having nice molecular biology tools such as the expert MTB RIF uh, or HeinTest or others, um, we can know very soon if, if the patient has drug resistance or not. So, so that is the critically important thing. We also know now that uh, putting a mask on the patient can help. 56% isn't 100%, so it's not uh, absolutely important. One of, there are several things I think we need to study in terms of uh, trying to protect healthcare workers and other patients in situations like South Africa where they've got a horrible outbreak of um, XDRTB, and that is, uh, is there a role for cough suppression? Um, I've had patients that have been racked with cough and provide them with a narcotic to suppress their cough, and not only are they very grateful, but they stop coughing. We haven't studied that in terms of uh, aerosol production, but um, uh, it, it would be reasonable. There are agents now that can change the, um, the rheology, that is the kind of the viscosity and, and nature of the uh, sputum secretions in the airways, and that may help to um, decrease infectiousness. And there may be a role for inhaled antibiotics, but those are all research questions. Generally, in the environment, the um, CDC guidelines now uh, suggest that we have at least six air changes an hour for new construction. It's over 12 air changes an hour. And um, if you're in a situation where you have neither, natural ventilation can help. Um, in some areas outside of the U.S., uh, crowding is a bigger problem and, um, you know, getting, uh, getting fewer patients in any one ward is a, is a good thing. We have the luxury here of using airborne isolation, which uh, creates negative pressure and can have directional airflow. And then um, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation has its role in some places where, say, there may be um, uh, crowded x-ray waiting rooms where there may be suspect patients, um, perfect place for UVGI. One thing that we don't talk about too much is, is what to do for um, healthcare workers and others who are exposed. Um, one of the things I try to emphasize in Sub-Saharan Africa is really avoidance of exposure of HIV-infected uh, patients. And other immunosuppressed persons should also, um, I think, avoid exposure to TB patients on a regular basis, uh, diabetes, end-stage renal disease, et cetera. Um, we're not quite there to really identify who's genetically susceptible. Um, but one of the things that was forgotten of the outbreaks of the late 80s, early 90s in the U.S. is that the healthcare workers who died of MDR-TB um, were all HIV infected or there was one who had a hematologic malignancy. So um, that's really critically important to, to keep in mind and I don't think emphasized enough. Uh, personal respiratory protection I think is, is quite appropriate, but this is a situation where it only helps one, if you're wearing it, and two, if you know the patient uh, is a TB suspect. So may not be appropriate for, say, emergency rooms or other areas where um, you may not be aware that there's a, a patient there. And another area that has not been well studied is what is the role of good nutrition? Um, it, it has always seemed to me in, in Africa that um, the, some of the healthcare workers who get infected um, may share some of the um, factors of the patients that we're caring for. That is that they may be malnourished, underweight, uh, et cetera. So um, I'm going to go quickly through these next two slides because I know time is um, moving on here. But a common problem that I hear is uh, issues around removal from isolation. And a lot of people throw around this, this two-week rule. Um, the studies that those are based on, unfortunately, have some flaws in that they, um, this one study from 1974, the patients have been hospitalized for over a month. So it's kind of tough to <laughs> say too much about early discharge there when they went back and looked at uh, transmission uh, to the household contacts. This other uh, one from 1973 was only 15 days. But the problem is uh, the issue of epidemiologic harvesting. That is, you've already um, exposed the uh, persons who will be exposed or those who are susceptible. So um, they're really not great, great uh, studies. Um, 
1993, the CDC had published some guidelines and suggested that we be very conservative and wait for, um, you know, culture conversions and that sort of thing, partially based on some of these data from a couple of uh, Irish lads who took um, sputum, washed the sputum, and then had injected the bacteria into guinea pigs and found that, you know, they could infect guinea pigs after seven weeks of treatment. The problem with that is what I mentioned earlier, and that is that um, bugs in, in sputum are not the same as bugs in the air, and uh, only, um, you know, a small percentage of, of bacteria survive aerosolization, and uh, with the additional stress of drug exposure, it's probably a very rapid, explains the very rapid decrease uh, that, that I had mentioned earlier. So in terms of discharge to home, I think the guidelines, CDC guidelines are pretty clear that we can, die, we can discharge uh, uh, patients with three negative smears if there's a good follow-up plan. Uh, the one caveat I have is to make sure the patient's clinically improving and that you're seeing some kind of microbiological response and that you've ruled out drug resistance. I got burned once in New Jersey with, you know, learning that there was, you know, nobody at home that might be exposed. And when the, the public health workers went out to the home, it turned out that there were a few kids uh, that were under five. So uh, you got to be uh, a little careful and utilize our, our resources. So to, to wrap up here, um, the, the myth that I would like you to be aware of is that the AFB smear has never been shown to be a useful indicator of infectiousness once patients are on treatment. All the data on it are really on untreated patients and, and transmission to household contacts. Um, so we should really view the AFB smear as a risk factor, not as the uh, sine qua non of infectiousness. Um, I hope I've convinced you that not all sputum smear positive TB patients are infectious. However, I haven't shown these data, but about 15% of uh, uh, smear negative patients, uh, that is those who are untreated, um, have transmitted to household members um, in three different studies. Um, most patients are not infectious. Unfortunately, some are very infectious, and some of our work now is uh, focused on trying to identify those who may be real super spreaders. The two-week rule is probably pretty reasonable, but it's really an imperfect guess, and um, we're hoping to, you know, to come up with some methods to really determine who's uh, infectious and who's not. So here are the resources for uh, infection control. The CDC guidelines are really the main resource. Uh, the one limitation to them is they're, they're encyclopedic and uh, it's tough to get through, but you should, you know, know where to look there. Um, the WHO guidelines are great if you're going uh, overseas or in a resource limited setting. And actually, I think the Curry Center has done a, a beautiful job on this very practical manual for uh, preventing TB transmission. Um, so um, I will, let's see, I think these, that's the last slide. The, um, uh, there's been a lot of folks who have helped me in, in this work, uh, and I you know, would like to give a special thanks to Eddie Jones Lopez now at uh, Boston, um, who had really uh, been an integral part of the team uh, getting all this work done. So let me stop there and uh, take some questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fennelly. So um, if there are any questions, we will uh, take phone questions first. Um, so if you would like to ask a question via the phone, please press star six to unmute your phone line, and I'll pause for a moment to see if there are any questions. You can also enter your questions into the chat window or the Q&A area on your computer screen. Are there any phone questions? Again, you would need to press star six to unmute your phone line. Okay, it looks like there are a few people uh, in the process of typing in questions, Dr. Fennelly. Okay. But I don't see any, okay, here. Um, Must have been clear as mud. How do you get the, CFUs from the airborne specimen collection device. Oh, um, thanks, Monica. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, just due to time, I didn't go into all the gory details. Um, if you're real interested, uh, contact me and I can go over it in some detail or you can look in our, our papers uh, in, the, in the Blue Journal, American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine. It, we use what's called an Anderson Cascade Impactor and uh, it was really invented, I think, and uh, first published in 1958. 
and it has six stages and there are 400 holes that are um, on each stage and you put a, a selective auger plate below um, each of those uh, stages. So the air is pulled in uh, under vacuum at a calibrated rate and then it goes through those holes and it size fractionates it so that we can then just, uh, we take out the plates and can just simply count. Uh, it, it turns out to be quite simple. Okay, uh, there's another question. Could you please elaborate a little more on the statement that most untreated TB patients are not infectious? Um, well, um, I should say they're not very infectious. So um, a few lines of research, including one study that is unpublished uh, uh, regarding our data in Florida, have suggested that only about 30% of patients are truly infectious and transmit to household contacts. So one of those studies was done in the mid 1970s or published in the mid 1970s from Rotterdam um, in uh, Holland, um, and we found a similar um, result here when we looked at data in Florida from 2008, and could only determine that there was uh, documented conversions in about 31% uh, of the, the patients we saw um, in 2000, I think, uh, 2008, if I didn't say that. So, um, and the cough aerosol data, if we look at all comers, uh, looks like the 30% rule is, is probably true. Now, a limitation of our data is that we had always studied patients who were just starting therapy. So it may be that uh, those data are biased and um, the true result may be uh, a little bit higher than that. The bottom line is that the um, most patients don't appear to be transmitting, you know, looking at that last paper we had, even if they produce a very small amount of, of aerosol, uh, it ends up that um, they don't appear to transmit to household contacts. So, it's probably clear as mud, but uh, if you have any questions on that, uh, if you want to take a look at our papers and then get back to me, I'd be happy to either uh, talk or, um, you know, share by email. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I'm looking at the time, um, and I think in the interest of time, we should probably uh, wrap up today's webinar, but we will leave the chat window open, so if you would like to enter your question in the chat field or the Q&A panel. Um, we can email those to Dr. Fennelly and um, post some an FAQ along with the recorded webinar. Um, so I think we'll, we'll end the training. So thank you very much, Dr. Fennelly. And this concludes today's webinar. So we'd like to remind you to please remember to complete the Qualtrics evaluation. And for any group members who may not have pre-registered, please provide us with your full name and email address either by entering it into the chat window in Adobe Connect or by sending an email to the web workshop email address at Curry Center. Here is our contact information, and please do feel free to contact us if you have any questions or concerns. And we'd also love to connect with you on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Thank you very much.